Hello, everybody. Welcome into Stacking the Box. It is another Tuesday edition. I am joined by Josh Hill, who for the OGs who listen to this podcast, they know Hill very well. Uh, Hill, you're filling in for CARM, so we have an upgrade today. Uh, how uh, How's Tuesday treating you? Uh, it's, uh, you know, just another Tuesday. So I did, I was just in Arizona. Now I'm back in Chicago and I'm just, I'm missing, I'm missing the sun. I'm missing the good weather. I'm missing the West coast vibes or the Southwest vibes. So we'll, are, we'll carry on with the Midwest energy that we can bring here. Are you missing the 105 degree heat? I am actually, cause it's like a dry heat. It's like, it's describing it like being in an oven is not the best way to try and sell it. But yeah. you know, anybody who lives in the Midwest or even out in the East coast too, like you get that humidity with your heat so it's 85 degrees but it really feels like it's like 110 and you're wearing a wet blanket that's just i can't do that but that's not what the 104 down in arizona was like it's like it's hot but it's tolerable so i can take it i can live with that how long are you out there for about a week okay so, nice nice yeah. and you met up with the esteemed robert murray who I uh, did. also has a fan side podcast you're a baseball fan you should definitely check out robert murray is like 20 years old and the biggest insider I've ever met. It's how he's done it. I have no idea the age he's at, but God bless him. Um, so good for you guys. And you guys will meet up in Orlando. Fan side's having this big thing that I will not be at because I have a seven week old daughter and I'd like to stay married. <laughs> um, but uh, that's for another day and another time. All right. We have a lot to get to uh, big show today, everybody. So we've got, Deshaun Watson, the Browns are going to lead off with that. Then we're going to get in a whole bunch of other stuff. Got some news on Kyler Murray, go into Baker Mayfield. So the Browns get a little double dip here. We'll talk about the Chiefs and the Packers, the Bengals, and then we'll have Ben Heisler stop by uh, at 1130 Central here, and we'll have him come on, as always, for some over-unders, some prop bets. Um, it'll be all all good stuff. But, Hill, let's start with what do we make of the Browns and Deshaun Watson? There's, there was a recent report from Albert Breer over at SI – says that the league's hoping to have uh, any discipline meted out before the season. Now, obviously, look, to set this up, for anyone who's not been following this, he Watson is still facing 22 civil suits, uh, ranging a, a wide variety of, of different allegations of sexual misconduct and assault. He has faced 10 criminal complaints, which were all dismissed by a pair of grand juries down in Texas. So as of right now, it is all civil suits, which are not criminal by nature. They're all financial in nature, but obviously alleging some pretty heinous things. Where do you come down on not maybe what you would do or what you think should happen, but what the NFL is going to do uh, with Deshaun Watson in relation to, you know, how long he may may be suspended for the season? Well, I don't have a ton of faith in the NFL coming down as hard as maybe they should. Um, I, I've seen like, you know, some, some reports out there, some speculation being like, he's going to play fewer than eight games this year. Maybe he gets suspended for an entire season. Again, he's got that fully guaranteed contract with the Browns. So it's not like they're taking money out of his pocket either way. And he's also, they kind of budgeted for this too. You know, they, with that contract, they're kind of expecting this, the hammer to drop here. At least they've set themselves up to be prepared for that. I think that the NFL is going to come down medium on this one i think that it's you know there's a lot of pressure i think from the browns on the nfl to not turn this into like a tom brady situation with the you know deflate gate and all that kind of stuff which you know tom brady what got like a four game suspension for that yeah. so you would say yeah. optically the way that the nfl's handled a lot of these cases before you know you think of ray rice you think of some of these others you know uh other cases that have popped up here yeah, greg, greg hardy, hardy. yeah yeah, yeah, they have to. The NFL should come down hard on Deshaun Watson, both because it's the right thing to do. They're a self governing body, they're allowed to treat this however they want to outside of the legal system. But optically, right. the NFL, this is their opportunity to kind of right some wrongs from the past and go, look, we do take this seriously. We are going to come down hard. And we also, there's outside of the optics, just from a good, decent human being standpoint, there is no place for this in our league. If you're if you're an employee in the league, we we do not stand for this, and you're not going to be allowed to play in this league if you engage in this kind of behavior. So here's here's how, and I and I think it's well put, Hill. I I would say this. Look, first of all, we're recording this on on Tuesday uh, late morning. If you're not watching live, um, it should be kept in mind that tonight on HBO 
there is going to be a show uh, with Brian Gumble, uh, his, his show Real Sports, which is excellent. Um, where many of these these women who are Watson accusers are going to speak. Now, the NFL's probably already seen the tape and knows it's going to come out, but you're going to have, you would imagine, some pretty viral clips that come out of this, some some pretty detailed allegations um, that maybe haven't been made public or haven't been made public in in, in such a way yet. So, like I, I hear the people who say. He is not facing criminal charges. Therefore, the NFL should not butt in and, and should not become the judge, jury, and executioner as it has in the past. However, the NFL is a business. It is an extremely public one. The NFL has suspended guys who have been accused of far less for a, for a long period of time. Okay, Ezekiel Elliott is an example. Um, I think Watson's going to get a pretty hefty suspension. You have to you have to keep to this thought. So recently, now they're they're different situations, but Trevor Bauer got suspended for two mm. years by Major League Baseball. Good point. Okay. If you're the NFL, you want to be the league that suspends Deshaun Watson for four games? I I don't think so. I I I would be surprised if he plays more than half the season. I I think he's at least going to get, and and again, it's my opinion, who knows, but I I think he's going to get somewhere around 10 to 12 games, and I wouldn't be shocked if he got a year. Um, Maybe that doesn't happen. Maybe the league says, hey, look, it's civil cases. It's not not criminal complaints at this point. They've been dismissed. It's possible. But the NFL got crushed years ago, and you mentioned this. Like Ray Rice, Mm -hmm. they got crushed back then when – they suspended him for two games, and then the video came out. What happens if they suspend Watson before these civil suits get get taken care of, and they suspend him on the lighter side, and then a whole bunch of other stuff comes out, even if he's not facing criminal charges? So I, I think in the end, the optics of it are what's going to drive the NFL more than anything, and that may be a, an unseemly way of uh, excuse me, an unseemly way of looking at it, because you say, well, it should be driven by a moral compass. Well, it's a national football league. No, they're going to be driven more by how the news cycle is going to react to it. And so that's why I think he's going to get suspended. And I think it's going to be a, a pretty hefty suspension. But you're right, because he's only getting one million in base pay this year, because the Browns made sure to take care of him every way possible. Um, he's not going to hit, hit a huge financial bump in the road. It's going to be more just about missing time. Um, look, let's so let's pivot now. With that in mind, now, of course. This next question is a little loaded because you just don't know how many games he's going to be there for. But do you think the Browns are a playoff team this year? Obviously, they brought him in. They they just brought back to Davion Clowney. Mm -hmm. Uh, They didn't lose any massive players this year. You know, they traded for Amari Cooper. um, You know, kind of replacing Jarvis Landry. Do you think they're a playoff team? Do you think they're outside looking in the AFC? I think that they're they're on the outside looking in in the first year of whatever this Deshaun Watson thing is. Cause you, you, you take, let's say he plays a majority of the season. Sure. You have to then look at the rest of the AFC and say, first of all, in the AFC North, are they better than Baltimore? And are they better than Cincinnati? Right. And I don't think the answer is yes to either of those questions. And then you have to consider at the bottom of the playoffs, are they better than some of those teams that got in at the end, like right at the bottom of the playoffs last year, or are they better than some of the teams that missed the playoffs but improved? So think about the Chargers and how, you know, once again, it seems like our annual, the Chargers are everybody's dark horse Super Bowl yep. favorite for like as long as I've been alive. It seems like they've been the team right about now. Everybody picks to go to the Super Bowl, but they are pretty good with Herbert and some of the improvements that they made. They traded for Khalil Mack, Denver and Russell Wilson. Like that's something that you got to think about. I don't think that the Browns make the playoffs this year. I'm not saying that the whatever this next era in the franchise is going to be is going to be as disastrous as some of the other ones. I do think that Sean Watson is a vastly better quarterback than Baker Mayfield. And if that's the difference maker, he's going to make them a better team. He's going to at least get them closer to the playoffs. I don't think that right now the Browns, if you look at the AFC, they're better than the top heavy teams. So even if they get in, they're not going to go very far because I don't think they're beating Kansas City. You know, we'll see what Tennessee is all of those teams, Buffalo. But 
my thing is I'm looking at Cleveland and some of those teams that missed the playoffs last year. And I don't think that they're going to be better than Denver. And I don't think that they're going to be better than the Chargers. And they're not going to get into the playoffs if it comes down to which of these two teams do you like better? Do you like Russell Wilson in Denver or do you like Deshaun Watson in Cleveland or quarterback X in Cleveland? Yeah. It's, you know, I, I just can't feel Cleveland this year. So I, when I made all my picks where I picked every game for the season, I basically went under the assumption that Watson would play every game just because mm-hmm. – I didn't know how else to handicap it. It felt kind of weird. I felt like you had kind of all or nothing. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll just put him in. I had him at 10 and 7, but not making the playoffs, losing a, losing a tiebreaker to Denver. So they were right on the edge. But I do think he's going to be suspended for some games. Oh, yeah. And if he's even suspended for four games, that's probably the difference in the AFC. Like mm-hmm. the, the AFC is just so good. As Gonzo points out in the chat, and I agree with him, it's a tough division. You mentioned Baltimore and Cincinnati. I'm with you. I think Cincinnati and Baltimore are both better than Cleveland. And – Pittsburgh, well, I think the Browns are better than Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's going to be a pain in the ass because yeah. it's Tomlin and that defense, and they're always a tough team to play, especially in Pittsburgh. They will give every one of those teams a tough game. Every one of those teams that goes in there, it's going to be a brawl. It's going to be 20 to 17 one way or the other. Um, I, I'll i tell you what's an interesting game. So on the schedule, the Browns host the Chargers. Um, I mean, that might be a game where – you're talking about tiebreakers at the end of the season, right? Like I, I saw Peter King, who I have the utmost respect for. He put out his power rankings. He for the whole league, one, two, three was Buffalo, the Chargers, and the Chiefs. Um, I don't even think the Chargers qualify as a dark horse anymore. It's to the point now where the Chargers are basically printing up the banner, and it's just a matter of whether or not they blow like eight games they shouldn't <laughs> blow. Um, but I digress. Look. I think the Browns, I cannot make the argument in good faith that they're better than Buffalo. We just talked about the two teams in their own division. Somebody's coming out of the South, whether it's Indy or Tennessee. I like Indy. but I, I And you can make an argument Cleveland's better than any of those teams. Fine. But then you get to the West. They're not better than Kansas City. I don't think they're better than the Chargers, and I don't think they're better than Denver. But that said, I think it's really going to come down to how many games does Watson miss because if he's there – I, on, on the field, I love the pairing of he and Stefanski. Defensively, mm-hmm. they're they're good. They're not great, but they're good. And you know, the only the only concern I have is offensively, like who are you throwing the ball to? It's mm-hmm. Cooper, and then it's a bunch of guys. But they have a great offensive line. They can run the hell out of the ball, so they should be they should be interesting. I think they're right on the edge, but I don't know if they get in. Yeah, and, and as far as the suspension is concerned, too, to, to kind of tie a bow around that. I wouldn't be shocked. I kind of agree with you if he gets that year long suspension, because if we're talking about optics and the NFL is no stranger to doing the wrong thing and just getting absolutely hammered. And, you know, and, you know, Twitter is not a, you know, a legal court. It's the court of public opinion. But that's the majority of where these conversations happen. And you can just see if he gets a four game suspension or a six game, even an eight game suspension. The first thing people are going to point to and it's going to be a lightning rod is Calvin Ridley. Calvin Ridley got suspended for an entire season for betting on football. And immediately the optics are the NFL cares more about its betting business interests than it does about women. And it's not the first time that we've had that conversation about the NFL, but that's why I think I agree with you leaning more towards the really dropping the hammer for what seems like the first time ever for the NFL is that's going to be the comparison everybody makes. Calvin Ridley got a year for betting on football Deshaun Watson got this for doing something that's far more heinous than betting for, and betting on the Falcons too. Like that's just stupid. Who bets on the Falcons? It's, I'll tell you what it is. It's a damn cry for help. <laughs> I, I mean, I enjoyed the, I, and I'm going to get this a little off because I don't have the story in front of me. But one of the bets Calvin Ridley put down was like an eight game, like parlay. I mean, you got to have some stones to throw on an eight game parlay for 1500 bucks or whatever it was. So yeah, I, <laughs> Calvin really that that story really that that one of these days that'll be like a 30 for 30 short um all right so we got Heisler coming on in 15 minutes let's get into our into the future um first one on the list I put down was will Kyler Murray be with the Cardinals in 2023 for people who have missed this he did not attend the beginning of OTAs for the Cardinals of course they're they're voluntary um or as I like to call them voluntary uh mandatory and then you have uh, mini camp, which is mandatory in June. We'll see if he shows up for that. He has not been happy with his contractual situation. His agent, Eric Burkhardt, put out a statement in all caps that, that as an editor, still annoys me. Um, 
Do you think Kyler Murray will be a Cardinal in 2023 as we sit here today? I do, because he's under contract through 2023. And there's no way that the Cardinals are going to cut bait on this guy it, for a number of reasons. One being that he's their best chance to win. Like if you put anybody else in there, the available people in there, like swap out Kyler with Baker or Jimmy Garoppolo, who are not the good. two kind of most available quarterbacks. Yeah, it's not good. He's also under contract for that, you know, last year. I think it's either the fourth or fifth year of his contract. So yeah. they have him. Yeah, they have him and they have him at a very affordable price. And this is also the guy that they doubled up on first round quarterbacks on to get. Because they had Josh Rosen, yep. there was that whole thing. There was a whole controversy with that. They really took it on the chin, and it looked like it was the right decision because Kyler seems to be, you know, mid upper echelon quarterback in the NFL. They're not just going to cut bait on this guy. This isn't going to be a Deshaun Watson situation where you know, I, on the field, not off the field, but because Deshaun Watson was sitting out last year, some of that had to do with the legal stuff. Some of that had to do with he didn't want to play for the Texans. He didn't want to yep. get hurt. We've seen players do. We see basketball players do this. This is not going to be that kind of situation. I think where the Cardinals are just going to get rid of this guy because he doesn't want to play there. They're going to do everything in their power to make sure that he is their quarterback for the next five, ten years. Because the other side of that coin is who is it? Are they going to go back to the drawing board? Are they going to blow this thing up and rebuild? You know, they're on a kind of a good timeline right now with Kyler where the 49ers and Trey Lance, we're not really sure what they are. The Seahawks, they're on the downturn. And the Rams, there's a finite amount of time with Matthew Stafford and Sean McVay that this team's going to be at the top of the NFC West. The Cardinals are kind of in a really good position with Kyler and DeAndre Hopkins and some of these other moves that they've made to be that team in the NFC West. Are they just going to blow that up? Because what they're going to nickel and dime, the best position, the position you need to have a star in to win a Super right. Bowl. No, right. they got to pay him. He's going to be there. So, I'm with you. I think he will be there, but I don't think it's going to be for the same reason. So, you're right. He's he's entering his fourth year. Next year is his mm -hmm. fifth year option. They have okay. him on the contract, and then also realistically, they have him on the contract further than actually can tag him twice. Okay, yeah, yeah. so they have they have all the leverage. Here. Kyler Murray is a good player. He's made the Pro Bowl each of the last two years. However, he's never thrown for 4,000 yards in a season. He has declined each of the last two years as the seasons have gone on, mostly because he's been banged up. Um, in a league where guys throw touchdown passes like it's going out of style, he's thrown 25 touchdown passes once in his career. So I like him. He's a good player because you also have to factor in his legs, and his legs are considerable. I like him. However, when you talk about is he going to be on another team, that requires somebody to trade for him. Now, of course, it would be interested parties, but to trade for him, you are talking about having to give up three first-round picks, right? You mentioned Deshaun Watson. Like, let, I think that's a pretty good barometer. So Watson, despite everything going on off the field, the Texans got a package of three first-rounders plus, okay? And so I think with, with Murray – You've got to ask that bare minimum. Mm -hmm. And then the team acquiring him not only has to give up all those picks, they got to pay him. And that Watson contract is going to F a lot of teams over yeah. because he got 230 million guaranteed, 230 million. You, Kyler Murray is going to be like, I don't have all that crap off the field, 250. That's it's a hefty price. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, and by the way, not to get off topic, Herbert and Burrow this offseason, oh. have fun, guys. I <laughs> mean, you're you're looking – those guys are going to be like 275. To, it's going to be – but I do think he'll be there. Um, but I think he's got to have an, a great year, career year here to really get paid what he wants to get paid. And if I'm the Cardinals, i got to tell you, if he, has a, if he has another year, let's just say he repeats – uh, 2020, since that was the year he last played a full year. Last year, he played 14 games. Mm -hmm. So let's say he throws for 3,900 yards, 26 touchdowns, a dozen picks, and then he runs for, give him the average of what he's done in his career, 650 yards, okay? He's good, but am I paying him $45 million a year? No, I'm probably not. I'm probably going to say, look, I'll play out the option. I think he's there. I think he's there, but I think it's going to be a, a contentious situation if he doesn't have a career year this year. All right, so before we get to Heisler in 10, in, uh, 10 minutes, we're bringing in Carm 
from from Bears OTAs. I feel like Carm has basically been stationed at Hallis Hall now for the duration. <laughs> um, now look, I mean, Carm, you know, for people who aren't watching this, Carm's on his iPhone uh, camera. It's like a hostage video. Carm, <laughs> how uh, how are things at Hallis Hall? Uh, first of all, I don't know what Josh Hill is laughing at. This is uh, a very professional setup sitting on a rock <laughs> in the parking lot at beautiful Hallis Hall, media walking in. We're going to be uh, on the field. I'll be putting out some clips of the Bears. Last week, uh, one of my videos uh, was of, of Fields throwing a bomb to sixth-round running back draft pick Treston Ebner who dropped it. I didn't even notice, by the way, that he dropped it until people started mentioning in the chats that the dude dropped it, and that's how it's going to be for the Bears this season. Uh, but, yeah, this is uh, our second our second day at OTAs, which will be my last day out here because the third one uh, we're all going to be in Orlando. So, But, at any rate, uh, bear down Chicago Bears, baby. Justin Fields, Justin Fields, Justin Fields. There you go. Blink blink twice, Carm, if you, if you need help. Blink twice. <laughs> <laughs> how uh... – how do you yeah. how do you feel about what you've seen from Justin Fields? I mean, mind you, this is OTAs where guys are running around in shorts and there's no contact and, and whatnot. But uh, thoughts on the on the second year quarterback? Uh, he, you know, they they put him in addition to that, Verderam. They they put him on a field like there's a field right in front of us, and then there's a field down yonder. Right. And 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 up that's where there. they yeah. yeah up so 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 that's where they they have the practice. So it's hard to really get a gauge on what's going on. Uh, but from what I can tell. Uh, they have him moving around a lot. So, you know, last year he was in the pocket, and uh, that did not work out particularly well. The offense didn't work out well, period. So the Bears are just all in on fields. We've talked about this. Uh, he had a piece yesterday in Bleacher Report where he's talking about he's going golfing with the coaching staff and getting to know each other outside of Hallis Hall. They're all becoming best friends. So the investment in the quarterback is enormous. And I'd say even underlining it, Nick Foles is now an Indianapolis Colt. Who's a better quarterback, Nick Foles or Trevor Simeon? I think most people would say Nick Foles, right? Won yes. the Super Bowl. Yeah, right? I mean, come on. So I, I think that that move was partially made like, hey, buddy, you're the guy. There's not even a whiff of somebody over your shoulder here. Plus, we're going to bring in a guy in Trevor who's not going to cause any ripples. A field's talking uh, pretty openly about how the chemistry with the Bears was bad last year. That, uh, you know, I want to cut you off because I wanted to ask you about that. And then yeah. uh, we'll let you go because I know you got to get the OTAs and whatnot, and we got to get the heist on a few. But I wanted to ask you quickly, that comment, for people who missed it, uh, I believe it was in that Bleacher Report uh, piece, Justin Fields said, and I'm paraphrasing, but chemistry wasn't good you know, last year in terms of it wasn't the best vibe in the building, so to speak. Uh were you surprised he said it? Where, where did you come down on that? I just don't know what he gains, right? Like, you know this stuff. Letting everybody know that the chemistry sucked, it's like – it's sort of like he's raising his hand a bunch of times now saying, don't blame me. This was not a good scene mm -hmm. here. Uh, I mean, maybe it's just an athlete talking openly, which is what we all want. But it does feel a little bit off, in in, in my opinion. Like, okay, the, the guy's gone; he's out the door. You're not you're not you're not trying to make any power play here. Maybe he's trying just to uh, let Eberflus and company know how much he appreciates what's going on. But it just feels a little weird to me. Uh, and he's also been out there, you know. And and this is maybe just the modern NFL player, but you know, putting on his Instagram, here we are in Atlanta, me and Darnell Mooney working out. Okay, that's what you should be doing you're an nfl quarterback like he, he, he there's just been a lot of look uh last year was last year but i'm just going to remind everybody that last year was not my fault coming out of justin fields which is a little bit bizarre fair enough all right go do your job get off the rock uh go in all there right. and watch justin fields through a telescope just, just know that I'm on a new diet myself and i'm trying to be just like mac jones who apparently is in the best shape of his life and uh the Bears passed on Mac Jones for Justin Fields. Should he we'll not see. be in the best shape of his life? He's 23. Yeah. <laughs> like, who the hell wasn't in the best shape of their life at 23? Call, well, me, when he's, call me when he's Brady, who's double his age, who's got like 3% body fat. Yeah, that, that might be fair, but there's also 23-year-olds who are making NFL money who want to enjoy their life a little bit and are not as committed as Mac Jones, baby. So give him a little bit of props. That's nice. He's throwing for 3,500 yards this year. All right, Carm. <laughs> enjoy Hallis Hall. <laughs> 
All right, guys. Appreciate it. All right. All right, so let's quickly here. We got about five minutes before uh, Mr. Heisler comes on. Want to get to something quick. We'll go down the uh, the list. So back into the future quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll skip down. Which is more likely? The Chiefs or the Packers getting to the Super Bowl? I put this on here because both teams are considered top-tier contenders, but also are going through significant changes. The Packers trade away Devontae Adams. The Chiefs trade away Tyree Kill. The Chiefs, I would argue, have done more to replace him. Not, not that they're going to replace him, but mm-hmm. that they've brought in some reinforcements. Guys like MVS from Green Bay, Juju Schmidt-Schuster, Sky Moore, um, where the Packers have brought in Christian Watson, but really that's been about it. They've stayed pat. Um, but of course, Green Bay also in a, in a much weaker conference. Um, where where do you fall on which team you if you had to bet on a hundred bucks, which team do you think has the better shot of getting the Super Bowl? I I would bet a hundred bucks, maybe another hundred bucks on the Chiefs getting to the Super Bowl. I think that you know you look at Green Bay. Yes, they're in the weaker conference, but they also still have Tom Brady to go through. And, you know, last time that didn't work out so well. And it was in Lambeau. It had everything that was supposed to go the Packers way, and it didn't. And that's a trend with a lot of these Aaron Rodgers Packers teams is they choke in the playoffs. Look at last year against the 49ers. Like, they completely folded like a cheap poker table, and that was their element. Like they should have won that game and they didn't. And that seems to be a consistent theme with the Packers. And it's a theme across coaches. You know, it's not just Mike McCarthy. It's now Matt LaFleur, who's my guy. You know, we talked about the OGs. I'm living in a beach house right now and all the Matt LaFleur stock that I bought like four or five years ago. So it seems to be the Packers, when it comes to the playoffs, they just turn into a different team for some reason where the Chiefs, You've seen, you said it, they were able to, they, they replaced guys that they got rid of big key pieces that are gone now. You know, Tyron Matthews is going to be tough to replace Tyree kill tough to replace. But if you're comparing it apples to apples, am I think, am I going to invest in Aaron Rodgers and Matt LaFleur figuring something out on the fly? Or am I going to invest in Andy Reed and Patrick Mahomes figuring something out on the fly? 10 times out of 10, I'm going with the chiefs. So I'm going to alienate a lot of people on this and actually say the Packers. Look, I um, I think – I'll be honest. I think the Chiefs are the better team. I mm-hmm. think the Chiefs are the better team. Uh, the conference is just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm going to go with the Packers. I'm with you on your Bucks and Brady. Um, I guess my my case would be I think the Bucks and the Rams are the only teams really in their way. Yep. And I don't know that the Rams were ever considered the best team in football last year. Even when they won the Super Bowl, like I was at the game and we were joking. I was joking with many media members throughout the week. Like, does anybody think these two teams are the two best teams in football? And of course, the answer is no. The Bucks are my Super Bowl pick out of the NFC. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a little concerned that the average age is about 47, <laughs> but I mean, I, I will. T- I'm, I'm a little worried about that hill. Uh, I feel like everywhere I look, the Bucks have some guy who's like 34, but I, I, I'm picking them because I think they're very good. The Chiefs, to me, it comes down to how good are they defensively by the playoffs? I mean, they're going to make the playoffs as long as they're healthy. The question for me is, are they a tire fire defensively and they've just got to score 40 points against any good team? Or are they pretty good? If if that defense really comes around, Kansas City's probably the bet and you probably take your $100 to the bank. Um, And by the way, with Matt LaFleur and your Packers stock, uh, or you're stocking him rather, not so much Packers. That's a stock that's a great like Apple stock during the regular season, and it turns into crypto in the playoffs. Yes. Okay, like you guys are just like Dogecoin, just going yep. over the cliff. <laughs> so enjoy your enjoy your beach house until January when all of a sudden you owe the IRS like 500 grand. Uh, it's been it's been interesting with the Packers. I would take them because of the mm-hmm. conference, but I I do think the Chiefs are better. And so if you're betting on who you just think fly out is going to be the better team. I think it's Kansas City, yeah. um, but it's just a hard road, man. That division, that conference is just is. They could go twelve and five, and I feel like in the NFC that's the equivalent of going like fifteen and two. So yeah. um, take the. I mean, my God, your guy's your division. I, you go it's, to hell. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is just that division. Is, nobody's got a bigger heist than Tom Brady. <laughs> His whole career, like I've and Heistler's here. We're gonna let him in a second. I have done this. Uh, be out of boredom. I've gone back and looked at who the quarterbacks have been that Brady's had to deal with in his career in his division. He'll literally the best guys 
our unbelievably washed up Drew Brees, mm -hmm. Josh Allen before he was good, and Chad Pennington. And oh, it's Chad not even Pennington. arguable. Like those <laughs> are easily the three toughest guys he's ever shared a division with. He had Favre for one year, but that was the year he got hurt. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. The fourth best guy is legitimately like Ryan Fitzpatrick. It, it's it, it's it, it's a hex that Brady has on the rest of the league. So congratulations, by the way, on going 6-0 in the NFC South. All right. We're bringing in Heisler, who uh, was kind enough to join us all week last week. This week told us to go to hell. He's here for uh, 15 minutes, and that's it. Erroneous. Erroneous <laughs> on both counts. It's not, not nothing but a lie. All right. So I left it up. To, I gave you kind of a dealer's choice here this week because yeah. we're to the point of the offseason where – I don't know what the hell to talk about from a betting perspective other than win totals and MVP odds. We can't do that every week. You, sir, though, have found uh, some odds that we can we can go over and inform the people. Yeah, so they have the uh, the match coming up uh, on June 1st over golf at the uh, yep. Win Golf Course. Yeah, I don't know if you're going to be tuning in, either of you guys, to, to watch uh, Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady take on Josh Allen and Pat Mahomes on the golf course. Uh, I always enjoy watching uh, Mahomes go at it on the golf course. That led us to, I think it was last year, where some fan heckled him, you know, watch out for Justin Herbert, to which he replied, I'll believe it when I see it. And uh, sure enough, you got a nice little uh, rivalry brewing uh, between both of those two teams. But what uh, WinBet did uh, was that they went ahead and set their uh, over-unders for the season for all four of those quarterbacks because they're playing at the Win Golf Course. So fun little opportunity to uh to cross collaborate there so we have passing yards for all four of those guys and we also have passing touchdowns so the the one that i thought was maybe the the, the most interesting one and it kind of goes right back into what you're talking about matt with tom brady is out of all four of those guys he has the highest numbers on the board both for passing yards and for passing touchdowns the over under on tom brady is 4500 passing yards 35 and a half touchdowns with uh, even odds on both sides. To me, I know that it's an easy division, but I'm still leaning under there because at some point, a lot of these games against bad teams are going to be blowouts. He's not going to have to yeah. throw the ball downfield. I know the numbers are reflective of the way that he has played in Tampa Bay. And again, this is somebody that threw for, you know, 5,300 yards. I, I'm still backing on at least moving away from that knowing that he may not play all 17 games at some point injury may set and he is going to be 45 years old. I love the, I love the under here, even though the recent year tells me that you should absolutely go over. What do you guys think? So Hill, all of you have the floor since it's your team. You go right ahead. Now, this is full of Kool-Aid because I'm drinking the Tom Brady Kool-Aid. I'm going over on these because it's, I'm going over because Tom Brady is a psycho. And he's going, if he's entering his final year in the NFL, which is what we have to kind of approach this as, this is his last dance, this is his farewell tour, where he's going to go to all these great teams that they have to play, and he's going to get his flowers. What he's going to do, if we know anything about Tom Brady, is he's going to go out guns blazing on top. He wants to come back and finish his career walking away with a Super Bowl, and he's going to want to walk away with a Super Bowl and a regular season MVP. And if he's gunning for these numbers, those are MVP numbers. We had the conversation last year about how Aaron Rodgers was running away with that, you know, race, but Tom Brady was right there. And when Brady retired, the narrative around that and the same tweet everybody was tweeting out was, I can't believe Tom Brady is retiring at the age, in his 40s at the top of his profession in peak form. He heard that. He's going to come back and he's gunning for these numbers. And imagine the kind of ego he has if he can retire with an MVP and another Super Bowl. That is the thing that he's going to gun for. And I think that if we get into some of these games, Ben, like you're talking about that are blowouts, maybe Todd Bowles is going to, you know, stick a pencil in the governor plate a little bit on the uh, <laughs> golf cart here and let him go and say, hey, man, go nuts. It's going to make me look good. It's going to look the rest of the team look good. And it's going to make you feel good and look good to the MVP voters. I think that that's the way that he's going to approach this. I'm going over on this one. I'm also extremely biased and I'm not a very good better. So this is not advice that I think anybody should take. This is purely just for my own entertainment. I want to see Brady just go guns blazing. Oh, really? right, so I will I will make it succinct. I'll go under, although I, I like Hill's argument. Um, I, I agree with Heisler for no other reason than I think the Bucks are going to be great this year. Um, 
I just think they're going to kill a lot of teams. I don't think they're going to need to tax him. Last year, Brady led the league in completions for the first time in his career, led the league in attempts for the second time in his career, 719 attempts. Um, it's an ungodly number. He had never thrown the ball more than 637 times before. Uh, let it in yards, 53-16. Let it in touchdowns, 43. Let it in yards per game. Let it in sack percentage. I mean, the whole deal. I think it's hard to have a season like that again. But he is 45. I almost don't even care about the age of Brady. I think it's more the fact the Bucs are just going to be running clock out. Uh, I don't know that they're going to have to play him the last week of the year, which that matters. Yeah. So I, I'm going to go under on this as well. I just think – look, I think he's going to have a fantastic year. I just don't know that they're going to have to tax him the way they did a year ago. Perfectly reasonable take. I, I, I think especially with Brady, like that's that's what you're trying to figure out because you know that the average is going to be there and you know that he can get to that number. And judging by what we've seen over the last handful of years, he's not going to miss time. But at some point, the number continues to go up and up and up on these projections that, that Vegas is going to have to make some sort of adjustment. You can't hang that number too high or else everyone just completely pounds the under. And I think you're going to start to see a little bit more movement in that direction. But it, it's a it's a fairly compelling one. I, I think another one that is interesting to me is Aaron Rodgers, his uh, playing partner over on the match. 38-50 is the passing yards total, and then 33 and a half touchdowns. Uh, just for, for context, for, for Aaron Rodgers last year, had 4,115 yards, 37 touchdowns. Right. Now remember, no Equinemius St. Brown, no Devontae Adams. I probably should have led with Devontae Adams because that's the guy that's actually the one catching most of the touchdowns there. I, I, I just have a hard time fading and under on Aaron Rodgers' touchdowns, even with all those guys missing. I, just because at some point he's going to find somebody and he's going to bring up and elevate someone that you hadn't thought of before, whether it's Christian Watson, whether it's Alan Lazard. I, the, the passing yardage, that can be a bugaboo at times for Rodgers. The previous few years, he wasn't throwing that many yards per game, but I do expect him to clear the 33 and a half touchdowns. So I'll go over when it comes to Rodgers on touchdowns. What about you for you guys? I'm going to switch it up. So I will take, I will take for the touchdowns. I'll take the under because I think they're going to run the ball a lot more inside the red zone because they don't have Adams to just flip the ball to. I think Adam, I think Aaron Jones and, and, and Dylan, AJ Dylan are going to take a lot of his touchdowns. However, they're going to have to throw the ball to win. And so I think they are going to throw the ball quite a bit. Here's what I find interesting. So his over under, as you mentioned for yardage is 38 50 in his career. When he has played at least 10 games in a season, the only year he went under that total was 2015. And he missed that total by 29 yards. I think that total is way too low. I, I mean, he, you're telling me that guy's not getting a 4,000 yards. I, I can't see that. As, now, if you want to say, well, I think he might get hurt or something, okay, maybe he gets hurt. But if he's healthy, I think he's getting 4,000. That's why I've been saying all season, these people who are like, he doesn't have any receivers. Look, it's going to hurt them because at some point you're going to play good enough teams that they can do some things schematically. But Randall Cobb or, or Alan Lazard or, or Amari Rogers are going to have 1,000 yards this year. It's just going to It's the same reason I think Juju Smith-Schuster is good for like 1,200 in Kansas City. You have those quarterbacks. I mean, look, it's just it's it's inevitable. I remember watching the Colts all those years when Austin Colley was going for like a thousand yards, and it, it was a bum fest in Indianapolis for years on end. It just didn't matter. Made no difference. Anthony Gonzalez was good for like nine hundred a season. So uh, I'll take the over on the yards, the under on the touchdown. Yeah, I'll, I'll go under on the yardage. I I, I agree with what. Heiser was saying, and I'll go over on the touchdowns just because I think that touchdowns are the sexier stat. And I think that Aaron Rodgers is going to be hungry for that, especially without all of these weapons, without Devontae Adams. It's going to be not quite the same situation where it was Belichick and Brady who is more responsible. Aaron Rodgers is going to be like, I'm the captain. I'm the guy who throws the touchdowns. Devontae Adams caught my touchdowns. I throw them. And that's going to kind of be a statement that he wants to put out there. We talked about Brady being psychotic about narratives. Aaron Rodgers lives, breathes, snorts all of those narratives. You know, it doesn't put anything else in his body, but he'll put those narratives into his body. And he's just obsessed with proving <laughs> people wrong. And I think that that's one thing he'll kind of, you know, that'll be something that strokes his ego. I throw the touchdowns. You guys catch them. It also, not necessarily a shot at Devontae Adams, but to Vordram, the point you were saying, it doesn't matter who's catching the touchdowns. 
I could throw it to a bunch of guys you've never heard of. I could throw it to Randall Cobb, who I'm pretty sure is, you know, an AARP at this point. Doesn't matter. I'm Aaron Rodgers. That is the end all be all. And I think that that's the kind of stat that backs that up. The yardage thing, I wonder if maybe it flips around and they're running the ball a little bit more. I like what you're saying, Bergeron, about running it in the red zone. Yeah. But A.J. Dillon really kind of came into his own last year after being one of those draft picks we laughed at a couple of years ago. That tandem of him and Jones, that could be a little dangerous. That's something that I see. Maybe they're using that to get down to a point where Aaron Rodgers can throw these touchdowns. But I'm going over on those touchdowns. Let me let me just ask you guys a, a quick question about Green Bay, because I think this aspect of them is kind of fascinating. As, as the NFL, most of the league is all focused on finding the quarterback, finding the downhill, um, you know, offense that that's going to be, you know, taking more shots downfield, um, moving away from sort of a defensive mentality uh, and a running mentality. Doesn't it kind of feel like that's that's Green Bay's MO? Yes, they have Rodgers, but it's still Rodgers approaching the age of 40. Mm. I, I wonder if they're trying, and this is just an organizational philosophy, where they're just trying to zag right now while everybody else is zigging. And part of the reason they can do that is because they have a quarterback still playing elite level football, but also knowing that that end could be coming soon. So you might as well try and find another market inefficiency. Is that maybe just overthinking it based off of how they've drafted? I mean, this is also a long sample size under this regime as well. I think it's an internal deep-seated hatred of their own quarterback. No. Um, <laughs> that could be true, too. That might be part of it. No. No, in all seriousness. Um, look, I, I think there's a case to be made. If you have a great quarterback, you want to give him as many weapons as humanly possible, right? I mean, that that certainly is what Tampa did when they won the Super Bowl a couple of years ago with Brady. And, and the, the Chiefs have done that with Mahomes for most of his years, and, and it certainly worked out just fine. There's also a case for when can that quarterback not affect the game? Well, when you're on defense. So mm -hmm. give yourself a really good defense, which is, by the way, the real reason Tampa won the Super Bowl a couple of years ago is because the defense just lights out in the playoffs. Okay. And the Chiefs, same thing. A couple of years ago when they won the Super Bowl, like everybody always talks about the offense. The Chiefs' defense the last half of that season was lights out. Nobody could score a point on them the last 10 weeks of the year. So I do think, and I actually subscribe to this, give your big-time quarterback, give him a great defense. In today's game, with the way the rules are, if you've got a great quarterback and a good offensive line, that quarterback's going to find receivers. Just is. He's going to turn somebody into a thousand yard guy who on a, on a normal team goes for 450. So I think it's interesting. The Packers defensively should be very good. They, they really should. They, they have guys at all three levels and they have a good offensive line. They have Rodgers. So that's why I think they're going to be just fine. The only time I think it does hurt you is you get in the playoffs. Like let's say they play the Rams. Ramsey can just lock up whoever he wants to lock up. And then it becomes much harder. You know, you can you can kind of stack the box a little bit. You can take certain things away. That's where I think the Packers get themselves in trouble because I don't know that they've got three or four viable options. Where I do think and that's why before you came up and we were talking about who would you take, the Chiefs or the Packers to get the Super Bowl. And I said, even though I'd, I would take the Packers because the conference stinks, I think the Chiefs are the better team. Because the Chiefs at least have this thing where, all right, you have Kelsey, who's the number one guy, but then you have Juju Smith-Schuster, and you have MVS, and you have McCole Hardman, and you have – like, you can still throw it. I, that's my concern with the Packers, is you're going to get into a playoff game where they take away whoever the one option is, and then that's that's really – that's why they lost to the Niners last year. Adams could didn't do anything, and that was the end. That was the end of that game that we'll see. It's a fun debate, like just trying to figure out like where to go, even though you know one team is stacked up much more from a talent perspective. The road for Green Bay definitely feels a lot easier for them. Uh, Josh Allen, this is uh, a one that I, I'm very much bullish on on the overs. And again, I, I usually try to move away from a lot of these early preseason overs because that tends to be more of the public play but I, I just have a very difficult time escaping it for Josh Allen so it's set at 4150 for passing yards 32 and a half touchdowns the offense is better than it was a season ago Stephon Diggs is coming off a down year I expect some positive regression back to the meme for him Gabriel Davis I, I know that there's some mixed opinions about him but I saw this from uh, from fantasy football underscore Victoria on Twitter. Does a great job. From weeks fourteen through twenty, Davis was 
outstanding. He saw 84% of the snaps, average seven and a half targets, uh, just under 75 receiving yards a game, and just over, he had about uh, 1.33 touchdowns per game as well. You add in James Cook, you have a ton of depth at the receiver position. You have Jameson Crowder now in the middle of the field uh, over in the slot, taking over from Sanders and uh, from Cole Beasley. Like just everything about this team is more prepared and with more depth to help out Josh Allen in the passing game than from a season ago. And we've also noticed that while he's still running and still a very effective runner, it's not at the level from a touchdown side that we've seen in years past. He's not sacrificing his body as much at the goal line because he trusts his ability now to throw downfield and also complete passes in the red zone. 32 and a half for me is way too low. He finished with 36 last year, but I, I love the over for both these numbers for Josh Allen. Okay, so I will say this. Josh Allen, if you look at his last two seasons when he's really come of age here, um, he – should hit the over fairly easily on the yardage. I mean, 45, 44 in, in 2020, and then he had just over 4,400 yards. Um, so I would definitely take the over on the yardage. For the touchdowns, he had 37 and 36. So I'm with you, Heisler. I, I would take the over. Um, look, I have them winning the Super Bowl. I think they're the best team in football. I will say this. I will push back on this. I do not think they're better offensively this year. In fact, I actually am a little concerned about them offensively. If I have any concerns about them, Crowder's fine. Crowder's been a guy for like five years. And I, I have no idea what to get out of any rookie. I feel like that about every rookie who's not like a top five pick. Um, the Gabriel Davis thing's interesting. I, I loved him as a rookie and I liked him last year. But I, I will push back a little. Those numbers are skewed massively. Those, those late season numbers by the Chiefs game in the playoffs where he went for eight catches, 201 yards, and four touchdowns. This is arguably the greatest game receivers ever had in the playoffs. Nobody's ever had 204 before ever. Um, if you go and look at the other numbers, so like, so just before that game, he had one game all year, excuse me, two games, he had two games, two games all year where he had more than 50 receiving yards. He had 105 against the Jets and 85 against Carolina. Neither one of those teams exactly the 85 Bears. Okay. Other than that, here were his yardage totals for the year, game by game. 40, 0, 23, 0, 16, 25, 29, 0, 27, 47, 30, 43, 40, 39, 41. I, I can't get over the moon about that. He had an unbelievable game in the playoffs against Kansas City. But my, my only concern with taking the overs, which I would take, I think Diggs is the only guy on that offense that really scares you from a defensive standpoint in terms of the weapons. I mean, Allen scares the crap out of you. But Gabriel Davis has to prove to me that he can go out and have 1,000 yards. Like, I, I don't know. Like, Dawson Knox, I like Dawson Knox. He took a step forward. But for all the Dawson Knox love that exists, and, and understandably, he's an athletic young tight end, he had 587 yards last year. Now, I had nine touchdowns. He was great in the red zone. Outside of the red zone, he was fine. He's middle of the road tight end, but he wasn't unbelievable. My concern is that if, if Diggs were to go down for a month with a sprained ankle, who the hell scares you on that offense? That is the one major concern I have with him. So we see it a little bit differently there, but we both agree we take the overs. Yeah, yeah, I, I like the uh, I like the overs on both, but my main thing with this one is a, a variable that we're not talking about that I don't know if it's going to rear its head or if it's going to end up being a success based on how much he's worked with him his entire career, but Ken Dorsey taking over as offensive coordinator and losing Brian Dable, what does that do to the play calling? Are we saying that Josh Allen and that offense is good enough where it doesn't matter who's playing or calling the plays? Or is Ken Dorsey already at that point where it's like, look, he's the guy. The secret sauce is Josh Allen. It doesn't really matter that tandem that they have going together because I think Dorsey's been there basically uh, – Josh Allen's entire career in Buffalo or most of it um, and working with him closely. Like he started with as the quarterbacks coach, you know, he's passing game coordinator. Now he's the offensive coordinator. That's a variable that I'm wondering how much that plays in positively or negatively, because that's a massive change that they made. I mean, they lost their offensive coordinator and a lot of the success, you know, we're naming off names here and Josh Allen is, you know, an MVP candidate. He's really, really good. Not going to take anything away from him. But a lot of that success we were talking about last year, we were kind of giving flowers to Brian Dable, too, and saying this guy 
I mean, he's he got a head coaching job because of this. So how much does that affect that offense? And how much does that affect maybe not necessarily if they're a good or a bad team, but some of these totals, because it is a transition. It is a different offensive coordinator. And are they just going to do the same thing? Or is Ken Dorsey going to be able to bring something different? Because if you just do the same thing that you did last year, it's very easy to figure people out in year two in the NFL. Ken Dorsey has to bring something different to the table. Is that going to help or hurt these numbers is kind of the factor that I'm looking at when I'm thinking about going over or under on these. I, I think that's a really astute point. And, and to your your point about um, Gabriel Davis, Verderam, in the early portion of the season, yeah, you're right. The numbers were not good. He averaged from weeks one through 13 just over 31 yards a game and barely three targets per game. Something happened in week 14. And again, the, the game against Kansas City certainly helped those averages out, but it wasn't the end-all be-all. And a lot of it had to do with him getting the bulk of the snaps while watching Emmanuel Sanders' snaps go way down. In weeks mm -hmm. one through 13, Sanders had 80% of the snaps. Davis had 37%. In those right. final right. seven weeks, his numbers, his snap count went up to 84%, and Sanders went down to 47%. Oh, listen, I... I... Like I said, as a rookie, I like Gabriel Davis. Um, I think he's a good player. My point is, though, I think there's this expectation. Like, you know, it's like, look, he had two games last year until that playoff game where he was even remotely a factor, like at all. I mean, I, I just – I think it's a weird like, – and, and obviously, look, there's a lot of Chief fans on here, so I'll use him as an example. Like, people have crapped on McCall Hardman his entire career in Kansas City. He's not good enough to – Cole Hardman's been a way better player than Gabriel Davis has been. Like, it's not even arguable. Like, Hardman's been a much more productive player in his career, and yet, like, nobody expects anything out of Hardman, it seems like, on national level, where it's like Gabriel Davis was penciling him in for a 1,000 yards. I like him. I think the talent level's there. I really do. But I will say, like, I do – that. if I had any concern about Buffalo, it is the lack – and I know some people have probably argued with me vehemently on this. I think it's a lack of depth offensively. If, if Diggs were to go down or have a bad year, so like, I don't know where the ball's going consistently. Like, I, I just, I, I have worries about that. But that being said, I think they're a loaded team. I think they're very good defensively. And I think Allen is going to hit those overs. All right. Final one. Let, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about Pat Mahomes for a second. Numbers, kind of where you would expect them to be. Uh, 4,350 passing yards, uh, 33 and a half touchdowns. So he's blown by those numbers in three of the last four years, right? Uh, over 5,000 yards in his MVP season. Um, went under, obviously, in 2019 where he missed some of those games. And it still stuns me that Mahomes was still able to play 14 games that season uh, after what we thought initially might look like a season-ending uh, knee and leg injury. Yeah. But in the last couple of years, he played in 15 uh, in 2020, still went over 4,700 yards, uh, did it again in 2021 in 17 games. But his, his passing average went down from from 8.1 per attempt uh, to 7.4. Still had 37 touchdowns. Right. No Tyreek Hill changes the dynamic, but they did get other weapons there. You mentioned Juju Smith Schuster. You bring an MVS. Putting all that together, this is probably the toughest one for me because I want to lean over, and and yet I I need to still probably compart compartmentalize just the threat of what Hill brings, both from a numbers perspective and also opening up the entire offense for everybody else. I think it is going to be harder to get more of these guys open, no matter how good Mahomes is. And that's why I'm a little bit hesitant here. So what do you have? Do you have the over or the under for these numbers? I'm probably, I'm going to lean. I'll lean under on passing yards for Mahomes and I'll go over touchdowns because okay. there's the Hill. He'll probably be on pace, and then there's just always a few games each year. Here's why I like the over on touchdowns really quickly, because he's going to have to throw a lot in the early portion of the season, uh, yeah, right? Like, is. they're going to need to score points for them to, to finish up, you know, five and three or six and two in the first half of the season, where I think seven out of the eight teams they play initially had winning records. Like, the Chiefs have a very, very difficult first half of the season. Then, you know, I, I think he's always due for those five or six touchdown games where he just goes absolutely nuts, has a quarter where he throws for 304 touchdowns. And I think that'll likely push him over on the touchdown category. But if he does miss any time, I, I think there's less room to make that up with some of those passing yard numbers. So I prefer the over on touchdowns. I'll probably lean under on passing yards. All right. So this for me, and I know some people scream by, so that's fine. This for me is the easiest one, along with Josh Allen, actually. 
I- I'm taking over on both these numbers. Okay, look, now I get 43.50 is no joke. It's a high number. 33 and a half touchdowns are significant. In his career, he's had three years where he's been healthy for the year. Obviously, the, the other one, Super Bowl, actually missed a few games, as you mentioned. 50 touchdown passes, 38 touchdown passes, 37 touchdown passes. If I had to pick a number I take the under on, it would be that. Um, the yardage is 5,100, 47, 40, 48, 39. Like, he's so far over those numbers. And I hear the Tyreek Hill thing. And I personally wish they'd run the damn ball a little bit more and they'd play behind what is one of the best offensive lines in football. But I don't know if anybody's missed this. Andy Reid is their head coach. So they are not going to run the ball, and I'm going to scream at my television every Sunday as they throw 55 times a game despite running for eight yards a carry. Um, I think they will throw plenty. I agree with you also, high school. Look, their defense is going to stink early in the year, if not for the whole season. They're going to be throwing the ball constantly. So I think that also factors in. But here's something that's interesting, okay? Patrick Mahomes has played only four games in his career without Tyree Kill. And they all came in 2019. Hill was hurt early in the season. That year, the receiving core without Hill was Travis Kelsey, which is still, of course, he's still there. Sammy Watkins and Byron Pringle and McCall Hardman. So you still have Kelsey. You still have uh, Hardman. You're replacing Watkins and Pringle and Demarcus Robinson with Sky Moore and Juju Smith-Schuster, and Marcus Valdez-Scantling. In those four games, Mahomes averaged 363 yards on 8.97 yards per attempt with eight touchdowns and zero INTs. I am going to hit the over. It is always about the quarterbacks. The same thing I said about Rodgers. There is going to be a guy in the Chiefs this year, I guarantee you, who has numbers who you're like, what? And we'll get $15 million a year from Chicago next year. And then we'll go for 700 yards. Like I, I will bet any amount of money with anybody out there, Juju, Hardman, or MVS, one of them, is going to put up, or Sky Moore, you want to throw him in there. We'll put up some ungodly stat line. And then we'll go out, and if it, especially if it's Juju, who's got a one-year deal on Hardman, who's scheduled for agency. We'll go out, sign with some team that has no offense, and go for 700 yards. So I will hit the over heavy on on Mahomes. Yeah, the only the only big money bets I've ever placed and actually won, really the only big money bets I feel comfortable making, are Patrick Mahomes overs. You know, you, there's games where it's like his touchdown totally. You look at it, you're like, look, we're going over on this because Heist, like you said, he has these games where he just goes insane. And I think that might be this entire season because if you look at the last two years, the psychology of the last two years for the Chiefs, they got humbled in the Super Bowl by the Buccaneers. And then that got followed up last year by what was a season long humbling where they looked entirely unlike themselves at times. I mean, they scored three points against the Titans. When they only score, when they just failed to score a touchdown against the Buccaneers in the Super Bowl, this was like an affront to the football gods. It's as though we had seen something that we never thought we'd ever see. And they consistently looked like that last year. I mean, Vern Ramon talk, and I talked about this on Sundays, but like Mahomes would just make throws that he would usually make in the past, and that the magic of the football gods would just work. And that throw would land, it would go for, you know, 60 yards these wild no look passes that he does he kind of got full of himself last year was very humbling for the chiefs i think that they approach it completely differently this year this is a prove it kind of year for them where it's like we can go out there we are as good as we thought they were and vertam your point about not running the ball ronald jones come into town if he can be a guy who doesn't fumble the football every single time he looks at it He's going to be a guy where I think Mahomes finally fixes him in a way that we thought Brady might have been able to in Tampa. But him and Clyde Edwards-Alaire, those are two guys, those are pass-catching running backs. That's why I really like these overs, because they get down in the red zone, what are they doing? They're slinging a little pass out, Rojo's going in there, or it's going the other way because Rojo just sees the football and realizes it's like peanuts and he's allergic to it. And it's going the other way. I was going to say, I look forward to I look forward to Ronald Jones fumbling, and then on the next series, Edwards Alaire having a hole the size of Kansas for forty yards <laughs> and just running smack dab into somebody's ass on the line of scrimmage. Um, that that's that's really going to be the name the name of his book, I think. Um, but listen, it, it's going to be interesting. Um, I will say that it's funny because everything you said, Ill, I think is right. Mahomes, by his standards last year, for half the season was horrendous. Mm-hmm. 
and threw for 4,800 yards <laughs> with 37 touchdowns and 13 picks. Like, and he was by his thing, he was awful for half the season. By the way, they might hit those overs just against the Raiders. Because <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that secondary. They may not run the ball once. Okay, that might just be like going five wide. Here it comes. That's good for a thousand yards, those two games. So really, it's just, is he going to get to 3,300 in the other 15? And if he can do that, they're in good shape. It's fun. It's fun. I, I love the fact that even though we still got months before the season, they're like sprinkling out just a few of these just to kind of yeah. wet your beak a little bit and dive right in. So we got we got a lot of overs on the uh, on the show today, which I, I, I think the uh, the stacking the box faithful will will likely be pleased about. You, you can't please all the people all the time, but uh, if they have a, a dog in the race here, uh, we at least hit the over on at least every single one of them in some capacity. I think we did, we did. All right, uh, Heisler, thank you, man. Thanks for uh, bringing the heat. We needed it today. We had I had no idea what the hell to talk about for betting odds, so that that worked <laughs> out. And the match. I think it's like June first or something, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's coming up uh, a week from uh, I think a week from tomorrow, right? Thirty one yeah, days in thirty one days in May, something along yeah, those lines. Yes, there are thirty one yeah. days in May. Yes, yeah, I, I am. Uh, I'm looking forward to the match. I'll, I'll probably sit there and watch it. There's going to be some good trash talk going on. Allen's the only guy without a ring, but Rogers has choked like a dog in the playoffs. I want I want Brady or Mahomes to say that to Rodgers during the, during the whole thing. Now, I mean, Brady could really say it to him because he's got a million rings and he beat him. But also, like, Mahomes has a ring in the last couple of years. Like, I want one of them to just make reference. Like, I want Rodgers to, to shank, like, a six-foot putt. And then one of them to be like, oh, what do you think it was, January? And then you see <laughs> see him just seething for the next, like, six holes. Right. That's what you, I want. You want you want my bold prediction really quickly on, yes, on, on the trash talk? So I, I think – Brady and, and Rogers are going to give it to the young guys the entire time, right? Like they're going to wait for their moment. And just like Scottie Pippen in 98, when he walked up to Carl Malone at the free throw line said, mailman don't deliver on Sunday. <laughs> That's going to be Mahomes or Josh Allen, Aaron Rodgers, as he has to try and sink a crucial putt. It's just something along the lines of something along the lines of, of those choke jobs in, in January. I think that's going to be the play. Like, they're going to wait for it. And then when it hits, it's I, going to be glorious. I want to see. I'm looking forward to it. I, I, you know, normally the match, like, I, I kind of loosely follow it. I don't really care. This one, because of all the quarterbacks involved, like, you can make an argument. Yeah, I know the Rams won the Super Bowl. You can make an argument they're the four best teams in football. You get the quarterbacks all there, right? I, I would make an argument they're all the top five, you know, with the Rams in there. So it's going to be interesting. I'm looking forward to it. This is where Carm would say, and watch out for Justin Fields in the match, guys, next year. 2023, <laughs> Carm, Justin Field, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes. Carm did Throwing. like a hostage video from Bears OTAs today. And we asked him about Justin Fields and how he's been looking. He's like, I don't know. He's on a field like 500 yards away from us. I'm like, that's good. That's good. Glad he's earning that check, Carm. Just bring the Hubble telescope over there next time. <laughs> you get a good look at him, uh, you know, throwing an incompletion. But uh, in any event, Thank you for joining us, man. As always, by the way, tell the people, obviously, bet side, of course, everyone who listens to this podcast knows that what do you have coming up this week and in, uh, in the near future? Yeah, obviously, tons going on with uh, the NBA postseason, Stanley Cup playoffs going on. I know that you guys are actually going to do a little mention of the Stanley Cup playoffs in just a second, yeah. but um, we got a daily show every day, 5 p.m. Eastern. You can follow and find it on YouTube. Just search bet sided streams live it's daily bet slipped it's always a couple of us each and every day at five o'clock and then that doesn't stop on the weekends we go live as well every day at 11 a.m eastern for bet and breakfast so seven days a week we got live coverage when it comes to getting you ready to bet that day so make sure you guys check that out uh on twitter at bet sided and then also right here on youtube as well just search bet side you can't miss it how's ian mcmillan doing is he is he stopped self-medicating <laughs> at this point from the toronto loss and the fact that the falcons are coming around in uh, the summer yeah, he's he's doing better. Um, I, I still think uh, I think watching Tampa Bay just take out the best team in hockey this year and, and the Florida Panthers in a sweep probably made him feel a little bit better. Yeah, uh, yeah. But but now he's now he's getting all high and mighty again. He he took the Baltimore Orioles to win on the money line. They were like plus two sixty against the New York Yankees. Uh, started doing like this whole like European thing where he had like three buttons open, if promoting <laughs> the fact that he had all this chest hair out. 
And now he's saying like every win, it's going to be like in major league where you tear an article of clothing off. So if he gets on a hot streak, I suppose it's, it's good for us, but it's also horrifying for I us. I got to tell you, we got to start rooting for him to lose. Um, that's, that's a shame. That's no way to live. All right. Heisler, thanks for joining us, man. Appreciate it. See you guys. Take care. All right. Let's close shop here real quick. Uh, Hill, what what do you have going on? I know you just got back from Arizona, but uh, what, what's uh, what's new in the life? You know, just kind of enjoying these basketball and hockey playoffs. I know you kind of you wrote this down to mention, but like we're big hockey fans. You know, we you're are. a big Devils fan. I'm from Minnesota. Wild fan. Wild, not so much. I am thoroughly enjoying. I'm in a very weird spot because I hate the Avalanche, but I hate the Blues right now more than I hate the Avalanche. So watching the Avalanche do what they're doing to the Blues is just fantastic. Like, I'm just taking so much sick joy. I felt the same way about how the Warriors took care of the Grizzlies after the Grizzlies bounced the Timberwolves. <laughs> it's not healthy. It doesn't do anybody any favors, but it feels good. So I'm like, all right, here we go. Big on the avalanche. But I'm like that Larry David gift where I'm like, eh, you know, with the, the lesser of two evils here, because, I mean, nobody wants to root for the avalanche. But, you know, the Blues, Especially with what those fans are doing right now, like no, thank you. Like let's get out of here. Like, yeah, it's, I'm it's not rough. dying on the Jordan Bennington Hill. Like he can take that. Good night. It's rough. Look, I, and and you know you mentioned it. Like, Nazim Kadri getting like death threats from these fans in St. Louis. Look, first of all, if you're sending a death threat to anybody, you're an asshole. Okay, mm -hmm. but then on top of that, like if you watch the hit, I know he's got a reputation. Mm -hmm. I get it. He's been suspended a bunch. He was. It was not a dirty hit. Mm -mm. I don't. I. I played hockey my whole life. Okay. I, and I. I was a center for a lot of it. So I was always in front of the net. Like there was nothing dirty about that hit. He was trying to avoid him, and the Blues defenseman steered him right into his own goaltender. I mean, look. You know what? We got to listen about the Blues for one more game. Okay. Because yep. in that, that's going to be in that situation. Uh, but I. But on the whole, the Stanley Cup playoffs are amazing. I wish the Devils were in them once in a millennium, but um, I enjoy them nonetheless. Look, I want the Rangers to lose badly for obvious reasons. I uh, hate them with a passion. The Flyers don't have to worry about those boys. They're even worse than the Devils this year. Um, the Calgary-Edmonton series has been awesome. I, awesome. I love it. The Battle of Alberta. I've always, for some reason, I have no clue why, but I've always kind of liked Calgary. Like, a, mm -hmm. if I had a West Johnny Goudreau, yeah. Even when I was a kid, though, I don't know what I think. Man, just like the jersey as a kid. So um, Jalen's laughing at me. The Devils go to hell. Um, <laughs> I, you know, wait, when I was a kid, it was great. Now it's terrible. Um, but no, you know, it's just man, it's so much fun. And I'll be the first man. I know there are people who get all pissy about this, but I love in the hockey playoffs and Stanley Cup playoffs how some guy like you'll get a report from whoever's down between the glass, and they're like. Yeah, so and so's got a broken femur. They knocked out four teeth, and uh, they, they might have a permanent concussion. Uh, doesn't look like he's gonna miss the shift, though, Bob. Like, <laughs> love it. Lo like hockey playoffs are just nuts. It's like basketball. Marcus Smart's coming out in a wheelchair. You know, like <laughs> it's it's such a joke, right? Like it's like that old Paul Pierce thing. He's got the towel yep. over him. He's, can you imagine what it would take for a guy in hockey to leave in a wheelchair? That man would never be able to go back to the locker room. That would be the end. It's just, it's so great in hockey. Some guy, like, it's like he's got like a broken foot from blocking his shot. And then he, you know, he's got it. Now he's blocking his shot with his chest. He catches it off the shoulder. He's got a broken yep. clavicle. He's out there just limping around. Hockey. And the overtime in hockey, there is nothing more oh. stressful than overtime in playoff hockey where no. some guy rifles one off the post and the whole place you know, gives it that like, oh, and it, like it's hockey has the best playoffs in all sports. And I had somebody the other day, I, I tweeted this and they were like, no, I think it's baseball. I'm sorry. Oh, have what? you watched baseball? <laughs> Fuck out of here. No hey, way. 12 <laughs> minutes of action in a baseball game. Give me a break. Some guy throwing 100 out of the pen who's an opener now. You don't even get these games where you have two aces. Hockey's the best when it comes to the postseason. Yep. Love it. I like uh, Daniel says, I'm in Vancouver. I'm cheering for a sinkhole to open up for the Battle of Alberta. Yes. <laughs> Fair enough. I, love it. I can understand that. Um, but, man, I, I love it. Also, and lastly, 
The combine, as uh, Jalen mentioned earlier in the chat, didn't get a chance. Oh, yeah. Coming back to Indy for the next two years, it's the right decision by the NFL. I can't believe they weren't the greedy savages they normally are. They kept it in Indianapolis instead of going down to freaking Jerry World, where I would have been an Uber for four hours trying to see somebody <laughs> lift weights. Okay, so Indy, people said whatever they want about Indianapolis, Midwest, flyover country, all that. Indy's a great city. It's perfect for that. I can't wait to go back to Shapiro's Deli, to St. Elmo's, get that trim cocktail, go to Prime and, and, and put on a couple pounds in an evening worth of worth of gin. So um, super, super pumped it's in Indy. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a way to get the uh, Tuesday rolling. There you go. Yeah. What do they say about the hockey playoffs? It's like doing cocaine, riding a motorcycle off of a cliff. Right. It's like, and that doesn't even begin to describe the overtime. Like it, it's just, and baseball, no, baseball has probably the most boring, I mean, extra innings. It's not even exciting. It's like extra innings. They have to sell it to you as though it's like, hey, you're getting more. You know, overtime is very like strict and very rigid. Extra baseball, you know, whatever. They have to put a runner on second so that it gets over sooner now. Like they're like these guys, the possibility of the innings. Yeah, we can't do that. We gotta put a guy on second. Like, let's go. No, nothing, I, yeah. Nothing says baseball playoffs like a four hour and nine inning game that's five to two. And oh, hey, by the way, you know those aces both teams have? Yet neither one of them started the game because they had to bring in the lefty for the first day. It is I, I am someone who obviously like I love baseball. Baseball has gone to hell in such a way it is it's almost irredeemable. Hockey, that's the other thing with hockey, it's great in the overtimes. There are no commercials. Yeah. Like you just keep trucking. There, I, I love like you get to like triple overtime occasionally, and they'll show like the ice time for some defenseman's been out there for like an hour and eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> like and then you know, like, they'll be, you're playing the next night, you know, it's an afternoon game. Like these guys are off like 10 hours. If you are not a hockey fan, I promise you, mm -hmm. turn tonight, turn on the Rangers and Hurricanes at the Garden. Turn on the Flames and the Oilers in Alberta. You tell me that you're not entertained by those games. I guarantee you'd be a hockey fan by the end of the night. So, all right, in any event, we want to keep you a stag in the box fan. We're going to go here because we've been, we've been chatting for an hour and 15 minutes. But, hey, listen, for all you who watched, Daniel, Clint, Jalen, Gonzo, all the, all the guys, Hefe, thank you so much. Appreciate you for watching and all your support as always. We'll be back next Tuesday. Last one in May, May 31st. As Heisler just figured out, there are 31 days in a month, so kudos to him. I'll be fatter because it's Memorial Day weekend, plus it's my five-year anniversary in two days, so I'm basically going to eat my weight and food. It's going to be Thank good. You. Speaking of which, holy hell, I got to get her a gift. Uh, all right. On that note, Hill, thank you so much for joining us. Like old times, I appreciate you coming on. Always a pleasure. And uh, we will we'll be back next Tuesday. But until then, for Josh Hill, I am Matt Verter, and this has been Stack the Box. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your week.